15 years ago, National Community Church was meeting in a DC public school on Capitol Hill. There was nothing easy about our first year. Total church income was $2,000 a month, and it cost $1,600 just to rent the school. On a good Sunday, we'd start with eight or 10 or 12 people. That's when I learned to close my eyes and worship because it was too depressing to open them. To be honest, I didn't really feel like a pastor. The church didn't really feel like a church. I felt underqualified and overwhelmed, but that's when God has you right where He wants you. Why? Because it forces you to pray like it depends on God. It forces you to your knees. It forces you to live in raw dependence upon God. And raw dependence is the raw material out of which God performs His greatest miracles. Well, one day as I was dreaming about the church that God wanted to establish here on Capitol Hill, I felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to do a prayer walk. I was reading through the book of Joshua and one of the promises jumped off the page and into my spirit. It says, I will give you everywhere you set your foot, just as I promised Moses. Well, as I read that promise given to Joshua, I felt like God wanted me to stake claim to the land he had called us to and pray a perimeter all the way around Capitol Hill. Part of me didn't want to do it because it was a hot and humid August morning, but I had this holy confidence that just as that promise had been transferred from Moses to Joshua, that God would transfer that promise to me if I had enough faith to circle it. And so I drew what would be my first prayer circle, and it still ranks as the longest prayer walk I've ever done. Starting at the front door of our row house on Capitol Hill, I walked east on F Street and turned south on 8th Street. I crossed East Capitol and Pennsylvania Avenue. I walked all the way to the Navy Yard and turned west on M Street. And then north on South Capitol Street. I paused to pray on the west steps of the Capitol that faced the National Mall, and then I completed the 4.7 mile prayer circle by walking around Union Station and heading home. It's hard to describe what I felt when I finished praying that circle. My feet were sore, but my spirit soared. I felt that same kind of holy confidence the Israelites must have felt when they crossed the Jordan River on dry ground and finally stepped into the Promised Land for the first time. It took about three hours to complete that prayer circle, but God's been answering that prayer for the last 15 years. Since that August day that I drew that prayer circle around Capitol Hill, National Community Church has grown from a core group of 19 people into one church with seven locations around the metro DC area. And God's given us the privilege of influencing tens of thousands of people over those 15 years. But it all started with a prayer circle. I believe that every blessing, every breakthrough, every miracle, every dream has a genealogy. And if you trace it all the way back to its origin, you'll find a prayer circle. Those blessings and breakthroughs and miracles and dreams are the byproduct of prayers that were prayed by you or for you. During my prayer walk around the hill, I drew circles around things I didn't even know how to ask for. Without even knowing it, I walked right by a crack house that would become Ebenezer's Coffee House, which we now own and operate. I walked under the marquee of an old movie theater on Barracks Row that's now our seventh campus, and I prayed around an $8 million piece of property that we now own debt-free where we'll build a future campus. If I had not drawn those prayer circles, I don't think we would own those properties. You see, God has determined that certain expressions of His power will only be exercised in response to prayer. Simply put, we have not because we ask not. Or maybe I should say, we have not because we circle not. 
The greatest tragedy in life are the prayers that go unanswered because they go unasked. But if you have the courage to circle the promise, circle the dream, circle the miracle, you never know how or when or where God might answer that prayer. Every book has a backstory. There's a moment when an idea is conceived in the imagination of an author, and that idea is destined to become a book. So before I tell you the story of the circle maker, let me tell you the backstory. Up until my senior year of college, I'd only read a dozen books not assigned by a teacher. Most of them were sports biographies with lots of pictures and stats. I just wasn't a reader. Then during my senior year of college, I was on a road trip and I picked up an 800-page biography of Albert Einstein. I fell in love with reading. Well, since then, I've read thousands of books. In fact, I'm running out of bookshelves. But I have one shelf with a few dozen of my favorites. One of them is titled The Book of Legends. It's a collection of stories from the Jewish Talmud, and it contains the teachings of Jewish rabbis passed down from generation to generation. Because it contains more than a millennium worth of wisdom, reading the Book of Legends feels like an archaeological dig. Well, I dug down about 202 pages when I unearthed what may as well have been a, a buried treasure. It was the legend of Honey the Circle Maker, and it forever changed the way that I pray. It gave me a new vocabulary, a new methodology. Well, it was the first century BC and a devastating drought threatened to destroy the generation before Jesus. The last of the Jewish prophets had died off nearly four centuries before. Miracles were a distant memory, and it seemed like God was nowhere to be heard. But there was one man, an old sage who lived outside the walls of Jerusalem, who dared to pray anyway. His name was Honi, and even if the people could not hear God, he believed that God could still hear them. Famous for his ability to pray for rain, the people pleaded with Honey to pray for a miracle. With a six-foot staff in his hand, Honey began to turn like a math compass, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, 360 degrees. He never looked up as the crowd looked on. When he was done turning, Honey stood inside the circle that he had drawn. Then he dropped to his knees and raised his hands to heaven. With the authority of the prophet Elijah who called down fire from heaven, Honey called down rain. He said, Lord of the universe, I swear before your great name that I will not move from this circle until you have shown mercy upon your children. The word sent a shudder down the spine of all who were within earshot that day. And then it happened. As his prayer ascended to the heavens, raindrops descended to the earth. The people rejoiced over each raindrop, but Honey wasn't satisfied with the sprinkle. He lifted his voice over the sounds of celebration. Not for such rain have I prayed, but for rain that will fill cisterns, pits, and caverns. The sprinkle turned into such a torrential downpour that the people had to flee to the Temple Mount, but Honey still wasn't satisfied. Not for such rain have I prayed, but for the rain of thy favor, blessing, and graciousness. Well, the downpour turned into a perfectly proportioned sun shower, each raindrop a tangible token of God's grace. Honey was almost excommunicated for his prayer because some members of the Sanhedrin believed that it was too bold. Listen, God is not offended by our bold prayers. He's offended by anything less. God honors bold prayers because bold prayers honor God. And eventually, 
Pony was honored for the prayer that saved a generation. It was deemed one of the most significant prayers in the history of Israel. The circle that he drew in the sand became a sacred symbol, and the legend of Honey the Circle Maker stands forever as a testament to the power of a single prayer to change the course of history. Remember the promise God had given to Moses and then transferred to Joshua? I will give you everywhere you set your foot. Well, the Israelites crossed the Jordan River and approached the ancient city of Jericho. It had to be both awe-inspiring and frightening. While wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, they had never seen anything approximating the skyline of Jericho. And the closer they got, the smaller they felt. I think they finally understood why the generation before them felt like grasshoppers and failed to enter the Promised Land. Well, a six-foot-wide lower wall and a 50-foot-high upper wall encircled that ancient metropolis. The mud brick walls were so thick and so tall that the 12-acre city appeared to be an impregnable fortress. It seemed like God had promised something impossible and His battle plan seemed nonsensical. In Joshua 6.3 it says, Your entire army is to march around the city once a day for six days. On the seventh day you're to march around the city seven times. Well, the soldiers must have wondered why. You know, why not use a battering ram? Why not scale the walls? Why not cut off the water supply or shoot flaming arrows over the walls? Instead, God told the Israelite army to silently circle the city. Well, on the seventh day, they arose before dawn and they circled the city seven times. Then 600,000 Israelites raised a holy roar that registered on the Richter scale and the walls came tumbling down. After seven days of circling Jericho, God had delivered on a 400-year-old promise. He proved, once again, that His promises and our prayers don't have expiration dates. Jericho stands and falls as a testament to this simple truth. If you keep circling the promise, God will ultimately deliver on it. The Jericho miracle is a microcosm. It not only reveals the way that God performed that particular miracle, but it also establishes a pattern for us to follow. It challenges us to confidently circle the promises that God has given to us, and it begs this question, what is your Jericho? What promise are you praying around? What miracle are you marching around? What dream does your life revolve around? Drawing prayer circles starts with identifying your Jericho. You've got to define the promises that God wants you to stake claim to, the miracles that God wants you to believe for, and the dreams that God wants you to pursue. Then you need to keep circling until God gives you what He wants and He wills. Now that's the goal. Here's the problem. Most of us don't get what we want simply because we don't know what we want. We've never circled any of God's promises. We've never written down a list of life goals. We've never defined success for ourselves. So instead of drawing circles, we draw blanks. Well, it was more than a thousand years after the Jericho miracle that another miracle happened in the same exact place. Jesus was on His way out of Jericho when two blind men said, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stops and He responds with a pointed question. What do you want me to do for you? Seriously? I mean, is that question even necessary? I mean, isn't it obvious what they want? They're blind. Yet Jesus forced them to define exactly what they wanted from Him. Jesus made them verbalize their desire. He made them spell it out, but it wasn't because Jesus didn't know what they wanted. He wanted to make sure that they knew what they wanted. And that's where drawing prayer circles begins. It's knowing what to circle. Well, what if Jesus asked you this very same question? What do you want me to do for you? If you can't answer that question, 
then you're as blind spiritually as these blind men were physically. Don't go through this series without answering that question. Jericho is spelled lots of different ways. If you have cancer, it's spelled healing. If your child is far from God, it's spelled salvation. If your marriage is falling apart, it's spelled reconciliation. If you have a vision that's beyond your resources, it's spelled provision. Sometimes Jericho is spelled without letters. It's a zip code that you're called to or a dollar figure that will get you out of debt. Sometimes Jericho has the same spelling as someone's name. For me, Jericho has three different spellings, Parker, Summer, and Josiah. Well, whatever it is, you need to identify it. Then you need to circle it. You can't just read the Bible. You need to start circling the promises. Listen, start praying wisdom around your kids. Start praying power around your problems. Start praying with faith around your dreams. That's what Wayne and Diane did when they got pregnant with their first son. In fact, they didn't just start praying for their son, they started praying for their future daughter-in-law, Jessica, by name for 22 years. But I'll let them tell you their story. So when my parents were pregnant with me, uh, they prayed over me every night. And uh, they continued to pray for me, to strong baby, baby name, um, all of those things. And uh, when they were doing some reading about uh, praying for your child, they came across this um, book that suggested them to pray for their spouse as well. And uh, so they continued to pray for their baby and the spouse. And in October of 1983, they um, got the name Jessica and continued to pray for Jessica and uh, their baby's spouse. And, uh, Later in December, they came across a boy name because they weren't sure what they were having a boy or a girl, and they uh, came about Timothy. And uh, in May of 1984, they had a little boy and named him Timothy and continued to pray for me and um, my spouse one day. I really remember hearing it at our rehearsal dinner and Tim's parents um, at our rehearsal dinner were just sharing uh, about how they had prayed for me for my entire life and basically just you know said that they had this name Jessica that was given to them they felt by God in October of 1983 that was the month that I was born and um, little did I know and little did they know that they had been praying for me every single day of my life by name um, and just incredible to know that my parents-in-law had been praying for me with that dedication and that fervency and prayer for for so long now that uh, Jessica and I have um, a little one um, it's definitely something that we've talked about um, praying for our baby every night while Jessica was pregnant was definitely a high priority for us um, every single day we prayed over her and um, we continue to this day, she's now three months old and we still continue to pray over her every day and um, no, we have not gotten a spouse name. <laughs> At least not what we think. You know, so you, you kind of, we have this story that, you know, about, you know, how Tim's parents prayed for us and so it's easy for us to think like, oh, maybe one day that, you know, the, the little boy name that we thought that we were going to use if we were going to have a boy, maybe that would end up being um, her spouse. but. I think one thing that we just have to realize is, you know, we're praying very specific things over her and we have no idea how the, those prayers are going to turn out and when we look her in the eye, um, you know, in, in 22 years, 25 years, what kind of answer to those prayers that we'll see uh, specifically for her. Yeah. Well, a few years ago I came up with a little formula, change of pace plus change of place equals change of perspective. You know, sometimes you need to get out of the routine to get some revelation. You know, I'd recommend you take a prayer journal and go on a prayer retreat and begin to discern the answer to the question that Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? But the purpose of getting out of the routine is getting into the routine of prayer. And the key is finding a time and finding a place where you can 
draw a circle for Daniel. It was praying through an open window toward Jerusalem. For Jesus, it was walking the beach before dawn. For Habakkuk, it was climbing a watchtower. Well, for me, it's the rooftop of Ebenezer's coffee house. I climb the ladder, pop the hatch, and just pace back and forth. And one of the reasons that I love praying here is because I feel like I'm praying on a miracle. So here's how I wanna end this session. I wanna present you with a 21 day challenge. Now there's nothing magical about 21 days or seven days or 40 days, but it's important that you have a timeline in mind and the challenge is simply this, find a time and find a place to pray every day for 21 days. Now it could be your bedroom at home, it could be a lunchroom at work, it could be 6 a.m. or 10 p.m. But make a prayer appointment with God for 10 or 30 or 60 minutes. Then pick a promise or a person or a problem that you're going to circle in prayer every day for 21 days. You may even want to form a prayer circle with others and pray for whatever is in each other's circles. Now it could be a promise in scripture that you circle every day. Ask God for discernment and faith to claim that promise. You know, it could be your spouse or your kids or a coworker who doesn't know the Lord. It could be a problem that you can't seem to overcome. Keep circling it in prayer for 21 days. Now, does that mean that God will give you an answer in 21 days? Well, for some of you, the answer will be yes. But for others, the answer will be no. But that isn't the point. The goal isn't getting an answer. The goal is establishing a prayer habit. Well, let me leave you with a promise from Philippians 4. And this is a promise that I circle with my youngest son, Josiah, all the time. In all things, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen.